Um, let me introduce myself. My name is Buster Brown. That's not a joke for you old folks. I don't, I don't have the shoes. I wish I did. Uh, young people don't have a clue who Buster Brown is. Right. But uh, I, we're at Georgia Mountain Falconry, and I'll tell you today we're we're pretty fortunate because it's uh, we've got more than just the Georgia Mountain Falconry folks here. We've got some other falconers here too, but Greg Ames. And Lisa, Lisa Fannin, this is Megan Williams, Jason Green. Back here we have two other Falconers. Hold your hand up. Clifford and Nancy, or Nancy lives here in Tallulah Falls, and Clifford lives in Tacoa. They're, they're both Falconers as well, so we have a number. Um, what we're going to do is, you guys are sitting down like we're going to start the program, and I think what we're going to do is let you come up and see some of the birds and then we'll start the, the presentation about 11.30. That's about 30 minutes away. So we have, besides red tails, we do have some other birds too um, that you can see. Um, I, I would ask you please be uh, <coughs> extra careful around them, um, especially the red tails. Red tails are notorious for, for their uh, nasty behavior sometimes. <laughs> uh, that's, that's why we love them. That's why we all have them. That's why in, in Georgia, 95% of falconry is probably hunting squirrels with a red tail. Um, it's because they're, these birds, there's, there's, there's just no, no compare with some of the things that red tails will do. But we have, we have a couple of falcons for you. This one right here behind Lisa. He's not a, he's not a statue. He's actually, he just has the hood on. Um, so, and we have, we have the smallest falcon in the country as well, an American kestrel here too. And a couple, couple of three owls, I guess. We have a barred owl, we have a screech owl, and we have a little bitty owl. A little bitty owl, the Eurasian eagle owl. She's in that box over there. And she'll eat all the other birds in here. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, oh yeah, we have the, we have the sharp shin hawk that Jason brought. Very, very rare to kind of see those up close in a situation like this. Um, but we're glad that Jason and Megan came because that, that helps us out. He's also got that very light colored red tail. So if you want to, if you want to come up, if well, I guess we can walk around because there's two things the birds are going to do. Number one, number one, they're going to bait. What bait means is they they forget their tether and they'll try to fly. It. And it's it's it. They have to recover back to the fist. So be aware of that. And the other thing they're going to do is poop. <laughs> and, and, and I'm glad we have a tile floor here because um, there's there's going to be some of that for sure. We'll have some people walk around some and and. Uh, let you see the birds, but we'll we'll we'll, uh, we'll go over the program and, and talk a little bit about falconry. But right now, I just kind of let you see the birds and and that. Okay. Um, oh, on the poop situation. <laughs> there's two, there's two things you need to know about raptors and poop. Falcons, Lisa. Falcons and owls poop straight down. <laughs> Hawks do what is called slice. So if Lisa's bird turns his tail towards you and the tail comes up, you're in danger. <laughs> Greg Ames and his bird are notorious for getting people. So. I'm dead serious. They will slice. And if they ate good yesterday, and his bird caught a squirrel and her bird caught a squirrel yesterday, if they ate good yesterday, that means that today's going to be really good. All right. So be aware, okay? All right. So I think what would be good is when they come up and want to visit, if we start with the front tables and then they go out and make their way around. Okay. That would be good. 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 That would be good.
See those boxes over here? That's the same thing. We call those giant dudes. The male thing is the whole bird. Dark and secret. They're all red too. No, you know those are all the same. Yeah, I do. We had a few of them. Since I retired from teaching and coaching, that's, this is all I've done. It could be worse, huh? It's been about eight years of it now. Thank you. Anybody want to guess as to how much this bird weighs? Wow. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah
How much? 28 pounds. Remember, remember, hollow bones. Who time? <laughs> remember, Al, straight down. You're lucky. <laughs> she weighs about eight pounds. About, eight pounds. about the same, about the same size as our male bald eagle. All of those, this one. It's a what? This is a Eurasian oh, eagle owl. Bald eagle be in trouble. She's not not native to the U.S. Um, notice the size of her feet. Yes. In Europe, they hunt foxes and deer with these birds. Yes. Yeah. There's is a, a uh, this is an American kestrel. There's a surgeon in Kansas who hunts jackrabbits at night with his eagle owl. Um, these birds look big and slow, but they're not. I'll show you her wings. She'll probably try to fly, but oh, wow. notice there's no sound. Right. You're hissing at me. Yeah. If I touch her feet, she don't like it. She'll hiss at me. Oh, too funny. This bird. This bird is not what we call an imprint. I got her when she was about six weeks old from a breeder in South Carolina. I wanted to get her when she was a week old. Owls are a little easier to handle when you get them early. So she's fine up close to me like this, but if I put my hand up, she'll bite. Uh, and it hurts. <laughs> this is the worst part though. Why are their eyes Well, it's just native. That, that's the, the, the owls in Europe, the, all the Eurasian eagle owls, they all have orange, orange <laughs> eyes. They have different colors. These birds are found in Russia and Spain and uh, all over. Um, she's the one I don't have to worry about cold. They, this bird lives in, in Siberia, 40 below zero. So I don't have to worry too much about the cold in North Georgia with her. Hear his? She will bite me. I'm not going to let her though. <laughs> Y'all just want to see me bleed. I know. Here's a question. Yeah, that's a, good, that's a good question because people think that hawks and, and eagles and stuff carry their own weight. They really don't, except owls do. An owl, her size, she could easily take a small raccoon or a possum up in a tree and eat it. Um, but the hawks and stuff, usually they can't carry more than about a third of their weight. But owls have big, big, wide wings, very powerful, so they can take stuff up more than than the hawks and the falcons can. Hey. I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What is her lifespan? Her lifespan. She'll live. Um, she's eight years old right now. She's had. Uh, she's laid eggs twice. Um, year before last. And last year, I don't expect her to lay this year. I don't have a, her with a male yet. I have a friend who has a male. And we're hoping that she, she'll have expensive babies in a year or two. <laughs> but um, she's, uh, what was I going to say over here? Last man. Last man. She'll live 60 plus. Yeah, you know, just like the big, you know, the big um, parents and stuff. The bigger the bird, the longer they live. I went hawking this past week in Arizona with some friends of mine. And Valkyrie has all kinds of different ways to do it. These guys hunt golden eagles on jackrabbits at night. And they're in the bird one of the birds we hunted was 29 years old. Big big female golden eagle. <coughs> hunt with them like somebody with a hunting dog. Except it's a bird. Yeah, instead of using a gun or a bow, we use a bird. The bird is the bird. Just brings it to you. No, it just takes it to the ground. We have, when, when the bird talked to Jack, we had to go to you. you got to get it away from the bird. No, we do a trade-off. You're not getting anything away from the bird. <laughs> you want to try to take something away from this bird, you'd be my guest. <laughs>
tend to love everything about Raptors and um, what Georgia Mountain Falconry does is we, we're Falconry outfitters. If you've never been on a hunt before with a bird, we take people on hunts during the winter. Um, the season's almost over. Uh, we have a season just like gun hunters do. Our season is over on March 15th. Um, so we're pretty close to the end of the season. But if you've never been on a hunt, I encourage you. Uh, we, some people call it extreme bird watching. <laughs> uh, you can call it hiking with entertainment. Uh, whatever you want to do, we'll, we'll talk about that later. We also do the Raptor Encounter, which is a, a private thing. If you came to, if you set up a private Raptor Encounter with Georgia Mountain Falconry, you would come to us in Dahlonega, uh, Lumpkin County, where I live, and we will have seven or eight hawks, falcons now, now so you get real close to, handle some. You can handle goose, for example. You also have a hawk fly to your glove. So that's the right raptor encounter. We do it for presentations like we're doing today. We do photographer workshops where people come and just take pictures of the birds for a couple hours. And we all have also done abatement. And you may not be familiar with the term abatement. Abatement is means that we're, we're hired to chase pest birds off with our birds. If you've, oh, ever, wow. if you've ever been to Mercier Orchard in Blue Ridge, Mercier Orchard in Blue Ridge had a real problem with crows getting the tops of the apple trees and getting the apples there. So they hired us a few years ago to come in with our Harris Hawks and chase the crows out of the apple trees. Sometimes we catch them, sometimes we don't. Uh, you know, you see crows chasing hawks all the time. Well, Trust me, the hawks can tend to turn the tables on them, depending on the hawk <laughs> species. But we will, abatement means chasing off pest birds with our birds. It's, uh, it's done a lot out west. Uh, there's a friend of mine who does abatement at Atlanta Airport. Um, he does, he chases pigeons out of the hangars and uh, tries to run off some of the bigger birds off, the, off of the uh, runways and so forth. But that's, that's some of the stuff that we do. Falconry. Everybody says, well, you guys have a neat hobby. And I can tell you right now, it's way more than that. Uh, it's an addiction. <laughs> uh, you can, you can really, it can really take hold of your life. T.H. White is a, real, a late English author. He said it pretty well. It's not a hobby or an amusement. It is a rage. Uh, King James I said it's an extreme stir of passions. When you start hanging around these raptors long enough, it's... Uh, it is intoxicating, without a doubt. And the problem is when you, you think your bird is a pet when you get hurt. Because uh, so, they're never pets. <laughs> what is falconry? If you go to uh, an Auburn football game, you see, you see what to me is one of the greatest pregame events 
ever anywhere when they fly that eagle before the game. If you go to Dollywood or if you go to Callaway Gardens and they fly birds over your head, and that's all cool stuff, but that's not falconry. Falconry is hunting. If you're not going to hunt, you don't need to have a raptor. Um, unless you're an educator or a rehabber, falconry is hunting. Instead of using a gun or a bow, we hunt with a bird. That's what we do. It's only thousands of years old. It's been happening for a long time. What species are used? Uh, there's a red tail, three red tail hawks with hoods on their heads. You see what's hanging underneath them, right? You know what they would be doing if the hoods are not on their heads? They'd be eating those squirrels. That's an American kestrel like um, Jason brought out and Megan had for a few minutes on her fist. The American kestrel is a, is a great little hunter, very fierce to be so small. That's a starling underneath her. And uh, starlings and sparrows are considered pest species and you can hunt them year round. So with a kestrel, uh, that little kestrel is, is mine. I intend to hunt her uh, spring and summer when the starlings and sparrows aren't quite as smart as they get, they get older. <laughs> Greg, and I, Greg and I trapped that bird that, that uh, they had from uh, in Calhoun, Georgia, um, not last January, year before, uh, yeah, year before. And uh, it's quite a story to hear about trapping. We'll talk a little bit about trapping as well. But kestrels is, are something we would never suggest for anybody to start falconry with because falconry is all about weight management. It's all about food control. If you don't know what you're doing with a kestrel, they're so small, then you can kill them by not get, giving them enough food. So we would never suggest you start with a kestrel. There's one, there's a, actually a grackle, which kind of shows you the, 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 the fact that a kestrel can do some damage. Uh, there's a Harris hawk with a slow duck. <laughs> They're not slow, trust me. That's a goshawk, a North American goshawk with a duck. The goshawk is probably the most, one of the most popular falconry uh, birds in the world because of their speed. They can take fur and feather. You'll get to see a little bit of uh, what goshawks can do when we show you hunting footage in a few minutes. Very, very fast bird, but also a little more temperamental than say the red tail. A little tougher to train. There's your duck hawk, not even a hawk at all. That's a peregrine falcon. And that's what happens when a falcon hits another bird. <laughs> Here's what we do mostly in Georgia. Uh, because we have so many woods and so many trees and so many squirrels, we typically hunt red tails on squirrels. Um, as I told you, I went out let west last week and hunted with golden eagles on jackrabbits at night. It was a lot of fun, but I'm going to tell you right now, nothing beats squirrel hawking. And the reason I say that is because when you hunt squirrels, usually it's right over your head. And there are times when the bird will grab a squirrel and you're moving out of the way so the bird can come down with it. When you hunt with a falcon on ducks, for example, you might put a bird up a thousand feet or more <coughs> and flush ducks off of a pond, but the ducks might get half a mile away or further before the falcon does its thing. Now you gotta go find it. And squirrel hawking, that's why most people squirrel hawk in Georgia compared to other things. But uh, squirrels are unbelievable. They're, they're, they're something, they're, they're to be respected. I've seen them do amazing things to get away from a red tail. <laughs> but you would too if you knew you were going to die otherwise. <laughs> here's, a, here's a crow that <coughs> took one extra bite too many. That is a Harris hawk, a male Harris hawk, actually coming out of the car. We call that uh, drive-by hawking. <laughs> um, there, it, and that's one of the things that we, that Harris hawk is what we use for abatement at, at Mercy Orchard. We literally drove through the orchard throwing the Harris hawk out the window. The great thing about that is if the crow gets away, which they do a number of times, the, the Harris hawk will just come back through the window. We don't even get out of the car. <laughs> this, can you tell what that is on the ground? That's a Canadian goose. 
And that, that falcon on it is a jeer falcon, the largest falcon in the world, species in the world. Still, it's probably not more than maybe three pounds. It'd be the, like the size of a, a good sized red tailed hawk. But that bird can take down a Canadian goose of 10 pounds or more just because of the sheer speed and the power of the bird. Um, if you want to, you could go to Alaska or uh, the no very northern part of the country and trap a jeer falcon, or you could buy one from a breeder. You could buy one that's solid white. It costs you about 15 grand, something like that. There's a uh, probably a hybrid falcon um, after the duck. And if you notice on the tail of that falcon, there's a little bitty transmitter. Yep. Oh. And if you're going to hunt with falcons on ducks, you better have a transmitter because you're going to have to find them when they make a kill. And this is two Harris hawks, and that's not a Georgia rabbit. That's a jackrabbit in the out west. And the Harris hawk, which we don't have here today, but the Harris hawk is probably the most popular falconry bird in the world because they will hunt in a group. They're called the wolves of the sky, the wolves of the air. If you go to, to Arizona, um, southern Texas along the border, New Mexico, you'll find Harris hawks and there'll be four or five of them hunting jackrabbits, you know, in a family group. And it's a lot of fun to hunt four or five of those birds over beagles on rabbits. It's a lot of fun. How do you become a falconer? You have to be at least 12 years of age. This is Georgia. This is Georgia. You have to pass a written test. And since we're there, I'm going to talk about a way to help you do that. Up here, we have some brochures about our apprentice academy. When I took the test 20-something years ago, there was nothing there was nothing to help study. I just had to get the books together, study on my own, and hope I did well. Uh, nowadays, I've been wanting to do this for a long time, and about four years ago, I started doing it. We have a little apprentice academy where we will prepare you for the exam as well as teach you how to make equipment and handle birds and do other things. So if you're interested in that, we have it every six months. This next one's in August in Helen at the Holiday Inn Express. It's a weekend thing, and on the back of this uh, is a schedule that we take. So if you're interested, I've got plenty of those. It's uh, The written test is not easy. Most people don't pass it the first time. If you don't pass it, you have to make 84 or better. If you don't make 84, you have to wait 30 days to take it again. Um, DNR is now sending people to us who are having trouble passing the exam. Uh, we had a young lady in our class a few a couple of years ago who had failed the test seven times. Um, it's, it's not easy, but if you have the right materials, you can do it the old-fashioned way, like Alex did. Um, but, but, or, or you can take the academy, which is a weekend thing, and it's not cheap, but we guarantee that if you take the falconry exam within 30 days of completing our academy and you don't make 84 or better, your next academy is free. And the reason we do that is because in 2014, the state of Georgia took over falconry from the feds. And the state of Georgia had to put together our own regulations, uh, redo the test, and all that. So Georgia DNR put together a stakeholder group of five falconers to do that, redo the test and regulations. I was one of those five falconers. I know what's on the test. <laughs> um, you have to find a sponsor. That's probably the toughest thing, to find somebody to sponsor you because you're an apprentice falconer for two years. Your first two years, you have somebody who helps you get started. Um, it's, it's, uh, there's only 200 of us in the state, so it's not easy to find a sponsor sometimes. Um, but it's, it is a huge step, and we talk about that in the, in the academy as well. You have to build facilities to house your bird, and we're going to show you some of those. Um, if you're like Greg, you build your own. If you're like me, an old coach, I have to get somebody to build it for me. But you'll see some of the facilities with, that we have to have the hawk. 
Then the state of Georgia comes and inspects your facility and sees your equipment and then they'll pass or fail you based on what they see, the inspection. So we, we have to jump through a lot of hoops, but not everybody should have a raptor at home. And that's why the inspection is such so important. This is uh, Greg's facility in Marietta. I'll let Greg tell you about it. I got, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've got a homeowners association just like everybody else. <laughs> so the one under the deck, um, they said, okay, so you can do that. And then the one down below, I wanted to add a couple years later, got a second bird, and they told me I couldn't do that. So I had my wife elected to the board. <laughs> <laughs> Shortly thereafter, I got written permission to build that. <laughs> But that's that's one example. I think this is this is Lisa's facility. Where's Lisa? There she is. I'll let Lisa tell you a little bit about this. This, by the way, this is Lisa's second year as an apprentice. So she's only been doing it for a year and a half now, a little over a year and a half. Almost two. Almost two. She's ready to get out of apprenticeship months. because we might have dirty stuff. So that's my view. So the side that has the window, that's actually where Roxy stays, and it's about. 10 by 8 and then where the door is that's another room it's what we call an escape chamber so I <coughs> use like her equipment scales and everything in that room but there's a door off that room into her mew so if for some reason I got her out of her area and she got loose she'd be loose in the escape room not loose out the door into the wild there's her that's room, my escape room. room or escape room and that's where Roxy stays. She's got the perch in the front. She's got the window in the back. So she's got a perch inside in front of each window. Then there's one up in this corner where she can roost at night and sleep. Do you, you mind telling everybody how much that costs you to have built? Well, yes. just give us ballpark. Okay. And, and I had still a friend that gave me really good price on building it, and it was when lumber had skyrocketed so to build that cost me probably around three four thousand dollars that's pretty impressive yeah. So, yeah this is actually my this is my facility now <coughs> on the left is my garage when i moved i live about about a mile north of turner's corner you know from mm -hmm. here that um and uh when i when i first got there i had something built because um, anytime you move, you have to get reinspected. So I moved from, from Marietta to the mountains. I had to get reinspected. And when I built my garage, or I say when I had my garage built, I asked the builder, I said, I want to build some mews in the back. He said, Some what? I said, <laughs> Some bird chambers. Um, that first one, you notice the barred windows. The first one there is where the big owl stays. The one on the right is right now the, the male Harris Hawks in. And I have a little hallway down the middle, and there's, you see the two doors on the left. I have four chambers behind my garage. And that hallway is my escape chamber, like Lisa's talking about. You, you'd be surprised how many times you go in to get your hawk or feed the hawk for some reason or do something in the view, and you don't close the door properly behind you, and the bird is gone if you don't have an escape chamber. The bird can get out in the hallway, and that's as far as they can go. This is the inside of it. That's a female Harris hawk in it. They can, they can sit in the sun and rain, and that's the sleeping perch or their roosting perch up in the corner. And that's really all they need. They don't need anything more. That's about a 10 by 10 room. Each one of those is 10 by 10. How do you acquire a falconry bird? We're gonna talk about trapping in a minute. Of course, you can purchase one from a breeder the, the lantern falcon you saw with the hood on his head, I, I bought him from a breeder. The eagle owl, I bought from a breeder. When I moved to, uh, to Dahlonega, Lincoln County, I sold my Harley and bought the eagle owl and the falcon. <laughs> so that just tells you a little bit how much they cost. But this is, this is what people think we do that we climb the trees and get birds out of the nest. And we'll show, I'm going to show you why that's not necessarily true. Here's a guy, this guy that works with us too at Georgia Mountain Falconry. David Lusky's his name, and he's a tree, he's got, he had a tree service at one time. Well, as soon as falconers find out that you are a tree climber, 
<laughs> they will ask you to climb trees and take birds out of the nest so you can imprint. Oh. And this, they, this, these two falconers found out about Damon, and they asked if if he'd climb a tree, and he said he would. And so this is this is right in the middle of uh, Milton Alpharetta area, in the woods between all the big homes there. And uh, they said that the, that the nest was about 60 feet up the tree and it was real close to the trunk of the tree. Well, when it, we got there, it was about 100 feet up <laughs> and 15 feet away from the trunk. <laughs> so I'll show you, I'll show you, hopefully. Here, here's the tree that he climbed. We put a GoPro on his head <laughs> and you're gonna watch him climb up. There's a Cooper, there's a Cooper's hawk nest almost 100 feet off the ground. And it's, you'll see it here. There's the Cooper's hawk nest. He almost had to swing over like Tarzan to get to it. But he put all the four, there were four Cooper's hawk chicks in the bag and lowered it down to us on the ground. And down there on the ground, those two falconers picked which birds they wanted out of the nest, out of the babies. There, they, there's the Cooper's hawk grocery store. <laughs> then we put the other two back in the bag and they went back to the nest. Well, after Damon put them back in the nest, we, we put the aluminum around the tree to help to keep possums and raccoons from climbing and killing the rest of the chicks. But I'm telling you, I'm too old to do that. <laughs> uh, and and uh, most people don't do that, but sometimes they do. How did you find the nest? How did you know where it was? There was a guy who, who does a lot of hiking and stuff, and he, he, he purposely looks for a simpler nest. Jason has a sharp shin, he'll show you in a little while. Sharp shin hawks and a simpler hawks is what he likes to hunt with. They hunt small birds. And he knew where the nest was. That's how we found out. So where was the mama? Mama was uh, making a little flyby. Him at the time. <laughs> um, but the, the Cooper's hawk mama will just kind of give you a buzz. A goshawk mama will hit you. Uh, I can show you another picture of a guy climbing the nest and he had a motorcycle helmet on because a goshawk was hitting him in the head. Usually we do, we, we're doing trapping. Um, that's a red-tailed hawk and usually that's probably, it looks like that's an older bird. But we're looking for a juvenile. Legally, we can trap a first-year bird only. A first-year bird, red-tailed hawk, does not have a red tail. It has a brown tail. So when we go trapping, we're, we're, we have binoculars, sometimes spotting scopes, and we're driving the roads, and we're looking for, for the red-tailed hawk that's on the power line or pole snag of a tree. We have had, I can't tell you how many times we've had the cops call on us, yeah. Four or five old men in the car with binoculars <laughs> stopped on the side of the road. We have, we have to many times explain what we're doing. But we're looking for a, 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 tail, a bird with a brown tail. When we toss the trap outside the window of the vehicle, most of the time, before we can turn the car around, the bird will be going to it. When, the, when you see a red tail on the pole or power line, they're hunting, they're hungry. Yeah. And when you, when you give them a couple of live gerbils, they don't see the nuisance coming out of the cage. All they see is two little gerbils running around. And they will slam into it at many times. And if they, they usually they're hungry when that happens. Now this is, these are three red tail hawks. Notice that it's not one red tail in the bunch, right? Those, that's the, this is the mother load if you're trapping. <laughs> That's three trappable birds. Probably big sister in the middle. You know, raptors, the females are larger than the males. The female in the middle and, and two brothers on the side. So those birds would all be trappable if we wanted to trap one of them. Well, and then back to the uh, police pointing over. I got stopped the other day, or one time when I was trapping, I thought I was a runaway. <laughs> Greg, you want to pull your bird out and talk about <laughs> sure. um, trapping? Is this this Apprentice Academy coming up in August? If you're interested, the one in August is too early for us to take people hunting. 
but what we do is at the end of the, the academy on Sunday afternoon, we, do, we get a list of people and we put everybody in the vehicle. We, we take everybody trapping the following weekend. And taking you trapping is almost as much fun as hunting because you're out there looking for your partner, your hunting partner that you could have for a season or you could have it for 10 seasons or more if you want. One of the great things about being a falconer in the U.S. of A is we can trap birds from the wild. And the great thing about a red tail is all you have to do is feed them for a couple of weeks and don't handle them. And trust me, they'll be fine in the wild. You know, so it's, it's, it's really trapping is a lot of fun to do. Greg's gonna pull out his red tail and, and uh, talk a little bit about the bells you hear and the stuff on his, on his, ankle, on his ankle. There's a certain amount of equipment. Most of it's very, very simple. <clears throat> Um, the bells are attached uh, by a highly scientific method. It's aquarium tubing and, uh, with a uh, zip tie run through it. So the uh, aquarium tubing, you know, you don't want to put a zip tie on a bird because it'll dig in. So you run it through the uh, aquarium tubing so that their leg is protected. Um, the traditional is leather. Um, I find the tubing just so much easier to use. Uh, the bells, uh, nature designed them, these birds to disappear up in the trees. And they get up there, especially early in the season, October, early November. Gosh, you just can't see them. And, you know, and that's fine, but all they can do is twitch a little bit, and you can hear the bells. The bells are two different tones, which makes it carry very, very well. You know, I use a uh, radio transmitter, um, and that's great. It tells me it's in a 50-feet uh, circle somewhere, but the bells tell you it's right there. Uh, the bells, they've been using these for thousands of years. The uh, anklet, this leather piece here that goes around the bird's leg, it's called an anklet. It's simply a leather piece that's cut to a pattern and you can attach it either permanently with a grommet or I use what's called a Hollywood, meaning it's theoretically uh, removable if you want to take a picture. Um, I don't find this bird that cooperative with removing and putting it back on so it stays on. <laughs> the, uh, these are jesses. The jess is the strap that goes through the hole it's in, in the anklet and goes down to your hand so you can hang on to it. Um, these are required by law. It used to be in the old days, you could uh, do the anklet and the strap as one single piece. Uh, the problem is, is if you lose your bird in the woods, now the bird is stuck with something that's hanging down there six or eight inches, and ultimately, given enough time, he's gonna get hung up in a tree. The, these, the bird can take out, and trust me, they do. Uh, every now and then, my bird takes it out, eats it, uh, it, it shows up later at the risk of being overly graphic. And, uh, um, but you, you've got to have a kind by law that can be removed. They're called Alan Mary. Um, leash. This is a really ugly co color combination. I do that on purpose. Um, try dropping a, a nice leather leash in the woods and finding it. Um, I, the first, uh, I bought, bought this really cool equipment when I first started. I had a $30 kangaroo leather leash, which I lost on the first trip out. <laughs> now I use extremely ugly colors, and they're really easy to spot. Um, lure. I didn't bring one, fortunately. I've got one. I got one. Oh, you got Lisa's got hers. Lisa's got hers. No, it's not mine. It's mine. But a lure is that thing you see on TV where they're swinging it and the bird dives at it and everything. Well, part of the training is, you know, you, you, the bird flies to you, you give it a little tidbit. Flies to you, you give it a little tidbit. Now you throw the lure out and it's got a full-size mouse on it, something really worth going after. So they get really addicted to this lure. And that's how you get the bird out of the tree when he's, uh, I've had enough of this, I'm just going to enjoy the sun. Um, and that happens. And with that lure, you can bring them down. Also, when you've got to get them off game, um, you want to, you don't want the bird to eat the squirrel because then you, you can't hunt for two weeks. Um, you'll be fat. So you want to take the squirrel, but if the bird thinks you're stealing the squirrel, uh, you will never find him the next time he catches a squirrel because he'll hide under a log someplace. The, uh, uh, so you take the lure and throw it there. He goes to the lure and you pick up the squirrel. The only other piece of equipment I think that is of major significance, would you do me a favor? Grab me a plate. The uh, most important uh, piece of equipment that you've got is a scale. And the scale tells you whether that bird's ready to hunt or not. Uh, part of the art of falconry is learning at which. At which. <laughs> 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 Thank you.
<laughs> part of the art of falconry is figuring out at which at what weight your bird hunts. You don't want him too uh, too light because now they're listless and, and, and you know deprived. You don't want him too heavy because it's oh, you know, I need you for it. I'm hungry. Um, so you, there is a magic number in there, you know, give or take ten grams that you got. And the scale tells you if you're gonna lose your bird today or not, or if you can go hunting. Other piece of equipment. The hood. Now you saw that on some of the other birds. Um, I don't hood my birds much. Um, I, I will hood them on the trap so I can get them off and still keep my fingers. Um, when they're on, getting them on the trap is easy. Get them off so they're tricky. Um, so the hood helps me do that. Um, if I'm going to uh, uh, file down his beak, it's called coping. I will use that too. Um, Buster uses a lure uh, uses a hood a lot more than I do. And it makes it, it does make it easier to get your bird out of the woods when it's time to go back to the car. The main reason I don't is because I got lazy, and the birds just love the hood. <laughs> they hate it, at least the red tail. And there is advantages and disadvantages to the hood. The next one around, I'll probably train him for the hood, because Buster's bugging the hell out of me. <laughs> Any questions on equipment? We'll show you a couple of other things I, I've got to put the vest on just to, we carry a, a medicine kit. It's not for us, it's for the bird. It doesn't matter if we break a leg or cut our cut ourselves to death in briars or trip over barbed wire fence. But if the bird gets a bad squirrel bite, that, that matters. We use betadine. This is silver, silver sulfur diazidine. It's for burns, for humans. It's great for squirrel bites. So we, we, we carry this with us anytime a squirrel gets a nasty bite on our bird. You know, you, you think, well, if the, red, if the red tail gets bitten by a squirrel, it can be pretty bad, but the red tail usually doesn't even, you don't, you don't even know if he's getting bitten or she's getting bitten. They just, they just bleed. They, you know, the squirrel can bite out almost to the seal, going to die, basically. basically. So the, the medicine kit is for that. We also use... The transportation box, the giant hood that you see the birds in up front, or the one that, that Goose has on his head. We also use a slingshot occasionally. And the slingshot is not to, to hit the squirrels, but it's to make them keep moving. And we use marbles for our, our ammo. Um, I think in about the next 50 years or so, people, when we go where we've hunted squirrels, people are going to find marbles and wonder what was going on. <laughs> but we'll use marbles and, and the slingshot if the squirrel goes in a nest or in a hole and we try to keep the squirrel moving, most of the time the bird doesn't need our help. And you can imagine that a marble ricocheting off a tree would be dangerous for your hawks. So you have to be real careful about it. That's just some of the things that we, uh, that we use. Some people use a a vest like this, others will do different things. It just depends on how much money you want to spend, basically. Um, how do you train a bird for falconry? One hour ago, that bird was on a pole in the wild. Now it's looking at this ugly guy. <laughs> and, that, and usually that bird's mouth will be open, the wings will be out. I mean, it's completely wild an hour ago. And now you can see by the tail that that's a first year bird, and this is a guy's going to be this is going to be his falconry bird, and, and uh, he's going to spend the first you know three four weeks of, of getting to use getting the bird used to each other. Um, they're again they're never tame. Don't ever think you're going to tame a bird. It's not going to happen. But they will get used to you. Eventually those wings will go down and the mouth will close and they'll understand that you have food to offer them if they do certain things and the real good ones understand that very quickly but it's called it's called manning and you literally just sit in you'll you might sit in your living room and hold a bird and watch tv for the first three or four hours but you better have a nice shower curtain or tarp behind because <laughs> remember the slice um, but it's it's one of the things that you just end up doing and when you get tired you put the bird in the box in the giant hood the bird can relax from you for a while and you get to relax for a while then you get the bird back out and you sit on it again and eventually you start walking around the house with it you have dogs you get them used to the dogs you start walking around the neighborhood just to get used to 
the bird used to people. That's the manning process. Now, this bird, this is not. I, this was not staged, by the way. This this is probably the best falconry bird I've ever had. It's also one the only bird I've ever lost. But this is a big female red tail, and she's in the basement, as you can tell. And I'm trying to get her to hop about three feet to my fist for food. She was trapped three days before. On day one, she ate food from my fingers without taking my fingers too. I just gave her food on, on the first, right out of the trap two hours later. Day two, she leaned over on my fist and took food off my glove, which showed a little bit more, uh, maybe she was just starving, I don't know. But this is day three, and I'm trying to get her to hop to my fist for food. This is a huge step. Once, once they get used to that, you can tell she wants to. That's a big, huge step for the bird. And you, you notice that she swallows that mouse down and she looks at my wife like, I'll take another one of those. <laughs> but I knew when that day three that that bird was hopping to my fist for food, I had a good bird. Um, I knew that she was gonna learn quickly. After that, I stand up and I'll back up from here to the projector and she'll fly this far to me in the basement. And as long as I can go indoors, there's no distractions, they'll, they'll come immediately most of the time. Then you take them outside, and they're on a crinch. You see that, long, that line in the grass? Um, that, that is attached to that same bird you saw just a minute ago, to her legs, to her jesses that Greg told you about. That line is called a creance, it's a nylon string. And notice I'm out in the middle of the wide open area. Because I want the bird to fly, that's about 50, 60 yards. I want the bird to come to my fist for food. But if she decides halfway across that she's not hungry enough, and she tries to get up into the trees, I can bring her down carefully and, and slowly and, and uh, safely without hurting her at all. Um, but this, this was, this bird responded this way most all the time. Here we go. She's coming to the fist for food. And once, and once that happens, usually that's about, you know, could be two, three weeks, maybe four, but um, in about 30 days, once that bird does that regularly, six or seven times in a row, that distance, you're ready to go hunting. Here's what she did after, immediately after that. I turned around to walk her back to the perch. Guess what she did? She flew to the perch. She knew the drill. She knew, hey, I go to this perch, I'm gonna get food quickly. So I didn't have to walk her far. But that's, that's what happens when you get one that, that learns what they're doing. Uh, here's the lure that I'm just throwing that up in the air. You don't really have to do that. But this, this bird, you want to make, make sure this bird, when you pull the lure out, you want them to come immediately. A bird will come, not come to your fist, but it'll come to that lure. If you're, if you're out squirrel hawking and you're, you end up near somebody's house and they have chihuahuas in the backyard, <laughs> you might want to pull the lure out and bring the bird there and get a, go somewhere else. It's no fun pulling your, your bird off somebody's pet. <laughs> Now this is a tea perch. That's a Harris hawk. Um, with a tea perch and a Harris hawk, you literally can walk through overgrown pasture and stuff for rabbits if you don't have any dogs. And you're trying to kick up a rabbit and the, the Harris hawk will be riding over your head. That's just a painter's pole with, some, with a cut <laughs> piece of a welcome mat. And they literally will go after the rabbit. If the rabbit gets in a hole or gets in some briars and gets away, the bird will just come right back to your tea perch and you keep walking. So it's a it's one way to hunt without without dogs if you don't have them. Now if you want to put more game in the bag, you have a dog involved. But but you have to get manning with you with you and the bird, right? You all, you also have to get the bird used to the dog. You tell me if you think these two are getting used to each other. Right? <laughs> Here we go. Oh my God. Yeah, you can, 
<laughs> you can tell these two are getting along pretty good, but eventually the falcon has enough of the dog. <laughs> wow. That's funny. <laughs> but you, you, have, you have to get that, you have to develop that bond too, because there are times when your bird will hunt and it, for some reason, instead of hitting the rabbit, they'll hit your dog. So it's not good, but it happens sometimes. Now, here's the next scenario. You're hunting in the woods. You're, you're hunting with a red-tailed hawk in the woods. You have three Jack Russells underneath the dog. A squirrel has gone down a tree and under the creek bank. Okay? That's the scenario. Here we go. <laughs> that squirrel is in that hole. The dogs know it, but they can't get to it. Keep an eye on that same hole. They're, they're trying to find, the dogs are trying to find another way in. They know the squirrel's in there somewhere. Watch him now. Here he comes. There comes the squirrel. Here comes the hawk. <laughs> That's a miss. Three Jack Russells, but if, if you didn't have the dog, you would have never had a chance at that squirrel. And by the way, the, the hawk didn't catch that squirrel five minutes later. You must love to eat squirrels. No, I don't eat squirrels. The birds eat squirrels. I ate squirrels when I was young, and mom used to fix squirrel dumplings and stuff, and they were pretty good, but I don't eat squirrels anymore. I mean, they're, they're basically the tree rats, right? I don't eat them. Um, before we take you hawking over the world, we're going to answer some questions for you. One is, do falconry birds just go after game birds, squirrels, and rabbits? And the answer, of course, is anything that moves is game. This is a barn owl that was flushed out of the desert in California. They were, the guys were hunting Harris hawks on, uh, on rabbits, jackrabbits, and the barn owl flushed out. That's a female Harris hawk that caught the barn owl. But the falconers were there, and they were able to separate the birds without anybody getting hurt. Now. That same bird that you saw come to me across the field and hop to me in the basement, that's the same bird. That's in Cleveland. Uh, and you can tell it's late October probably, still leaves in the trees. I pulled a vine going up through a squirrel's nest. And instead of squirrel popping out, Mr. Possum did. And I screamed literally out loud at my bird, don't do it. <laughs> she was she was probably 50 yards away in another tree, but as soon as she that squirrel popped out of the out of the nest, she leaned forward and I, I just yelled, "Don't do it!" Well, the possum just stood still, and there was kind of a standoff for about 30 seconds, but then the possum screwed up. It turned around and went back in the nest. Well, she slammed into it at full speed from 50 yards away, and this is a squirrel nest that wasn't maybe twice as high as this ceiling, not very far off the ground like they usually are. And I'm listening to what I thought was my bird being chewed up by this possum. And uh, all of a sudden, she pulls the possum out and she puts one wing on one limb, one wing on another one, and she's holding the possum by its head for about almost seven minutes. And I'm watching this and I'm watching blood dropping down to the ground. And I just knew that my, my bird was chewed up. But uh, she tried to fly with it after it, it finally gave up the ghost. And of course she couldn't. And I took it home and weighed it. The possum weighed 12 pounds. She weighs about three. She didn't have a scratch, but I was very, very lucky. But we had a friend of mine, a, a friend of my apprentice from one of the academies. His bird caught a raccoon the other day. You would rather them not go after him. But it, it, he got lucky too. The bird, the bird did good. Now Lisa and I went hunting last winter. This is January, about mid-January. It's about 40 degrees outside, and my bird comes out of the tree and goes towards the ground about 50 yards from us. Lisa got to it before I did. That's a baby copperhead in the middle of January, out on the out, of, uh, evidently swimming on a rock. Unfortunately, my bird grabbed it by the head and killed it, but uh, we're lucky. Um, I've seen falconry birds die from, from snake bites. Most of the time, the bird knows how to do it, how to grab the head, but if they don't, if they get, if they get bit on the feet, toes, or low on the leg, they can handle it. They may swell up for a week, 
and they can't put any weight on that leg, but after that, they'll go get through it. But if they get bit high on the leg or up on the chest, they'll be dead within an hour. And it does happen. But that was a little baby copperhead. I was glad that the bird didn't get bit. Why is squirrel such a difficult quarry? That squirrel came out of that nest, and you see now that the bird has it by the butt. And the red, the squirrel's doing pull-ups with the red tail. <laughs> the uh, squirrels will do anything to get away. And I, we've seen red tails hang upside down like that for 20 minutes with a squirrel. Holding on, the squirrel's not giving up, and the red tail certainly is not going to give up. So they'll hang like that for a long time. We hope that they, eventually they come down like they're supposed to. But there's why. <laughs> you think I'm kidding, what, look. They even have tape that can fly away. <laughs> You're going to see one in a minute. We have squirrels do what we call a bailout. Especially now in this time of the season, the, no, no dumb squirrels are still around, just the smart ones that are still left yeah. by February. And what they will do is they'll go to the top of the tree to get away from a the hawk. They know a red tail has trouble flying straight up. So they'll go to the very top of the tree. And then the red tail will ladder, that we call ladder. They'll go limb to limb and work their way up. Well, now the squirrel has a decision to make. Am I going to run down the trunk or am I just going to jump? And a lot of times they'll just jump. And it doesn't matter what's below them or how far up they are. Uh, you're going to see it in, in a few seconds on the, the uh, hunting footage. Here we go. Hopefully. Here we go. We're taking the bird out of the giant hood. You can tell that that's Cleveland. That's Jay Westmoreland's house across. You don't know who Jay is. Lives in Cleveland. We're going to let the birds go up in the trees. Now we're going to walk through the woods. Pulling vines, shaking trees, this is what we hope happens. Watch the squirrel put on the brakes and the red tail miss. Now usually the squirrel's gonna get in the nearest hole to get away. They know where every hole is in the woods, you can know it. This, this squirrel didn't do that and he paid the price. Now sometimes they'll float straight down like a parachute down, and sometimes they'll rip the squirrel off a tree and carry it 50, 60 yards. Here comes a squirrel up in the top of the tree and it decides to jump. Watch it. There's a squirrel, there comes the hawk. That is not a flying squirrel. We've seen red tails catch them in midair. We've seen red tails slam them into the ground. I've seen red tail and squirrel hit asphalt, knock them both completely out. Um, this is rabbit hawking. The, the bird flies over briars and stuff, and you get rabbits moving, they'll do a wing over like that and dive straight into the briars after the rabbit. Here's one. You think, well, do they catch them all the time? No, sometimes a rabbit makes a good move, like this one. <laughs> now you tell me if you think this next rabbit wanted to live. <laughs> That's a heck of a move right there. Barbed wire fence is bad stuff. Barbed wire fences are bad stuff for your birds. This is what normally happens for Harris hawks, they hunt in a group. Here's what happens when the Harris hawk grabs the wrong end of a jackrabbit. <laughs> Notice the shadow behind them, that's the falcon they're trying to catch up. <laughs> Here's a, if you have bird feeders at your house, this is a Cooper's hawk and he, he appreciates you setting up the bird feeder for him to eat birds off the bird feeder. That's a wild quail. Now here's a rabbit that got away from four Harris hawks but forgot about the rail. Oh, oh. <laughs> this is on the beach in California. This is a falcon hitting a duck. You can see the duck comes down. There's the result. This is a guy sneaking up on a duck pond with a gossip. He flushes all the ducks off the pond and they're all fast. This, this one wasn't quite fast enough. The goshawk is known for their speed. 
looking for some dry land for tape. This next one is a jackrabbit coming out of the snow in Kansas. Watch this, it's pretty interesting. The bird comes off the falconer's glove and misses. And then another miss. And then another miss. And then you get a little you get a little uh, rodeo action here. Right there. And then the, and then the jackrabbit gets away. Here's a, here's a rabbit, a cottontail, going underneath the air conditioning unit. The bird goes behind it, stays after it, and it the rabbit goes under the fence. And gets away. Now, this is what I was telling you about drive-by hawking. This is a thing on the on the steering wheel. This is actually an industrial park in, in Marietta. You throw the bird out the window, and the little black things in the grass are starlings. And you can see that the starling and the kestrel are about the same size. And here's an eagle on a deer. Oh, wow. That's a golden eagle on a roe deer in Europe. And this next guy is doing it wrong. It's the bird that's supposed to catch the red. Okay, questions? Yes, you can. If you got the right bird, you can bring them and sell them to them. You can bring them if you have a breeding permit. How often do the birds get injured? How often do they get injured? Uh, I can tell you this. I've been doing this uh, 21 years now, and I've taken a bird to the vet uh, three times. And all, every time was for a bad squirrel body. Now, one time I did have my red tail um, go through a, 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 a barbed wire fence after a squirrel, and it just it just cut the, the feathers off the top of her head. I thought it decapitated her. She didn't she didn't notice the wire. She, they don't. She's diving at this squirrel running under the fence, and, and I saw feathers. And I thought, shoot, I lost the bird, but it, she just had a nice fade <laughs> right across here. But they do, they do get hurt. When you talk about when you guys were trapped in birds, is the license like actually something you carry around in your wallet? Yeah, in your wallet, on your phone. You have to, to be a falconer, you have to have a hunting permit and a, and a falconry permit. So you have to have both. Yes? How long do you typically, typically keep a bird? Most fal I would say most falconers trap a bird in September, train it and hunt it all winter and let them go in the spring. Some do what we call intermute or take them through the mold. Uh, Greg's bird is going on year number four. She's, this is the third season with his bird. Um, that bird that I told you I lost, that was her sixth season with me. And two weeks before I was gonna let her go, she, went, she chased off the female to get with the male. And I never saw her again. But uh, it just depends. That's one of the great things about falconry in the U.S. is when you trap a red tail, for example, you keep them as long or as little. A lot of people don't want to deal with the birds in the summertime. So they'll, they'll trap and train and hunt, and then in the spring, when the bird's been through the season, let them go. Cool. You guys know that 70% of raptors die in their first year, right? 70% don't make it. So if you, if you get a bird, a trap a bird, young bird, and you get it through a season of hunting, even if they're not good hunters, they're gonna eat anyway with you. So you get them through that first season, their chance of survival is a whole lot better after that. Why are the survival rates so low? They freeze to death, they starve to oh. death, they get electrocuted, they go after things they shouldn't have to go after, like raccoons and possums. You know, they get hit by cars. Uh, there's so many th wow. so many ways for them, for them to, to die. First year birds are the ones that you see on your swing set in the afternoons or on your, on your fence. So they, they, you get real close to them. They don't know any better. The adults don't let you do that, but the youngsters do. And you know, may not know it's a youngster because it's, it's a huge bird, mm -hmm. but uh, a red tail is full grown in about 50 days. So oh, okay. once, once you see a big bird, if it's especially a big red tail, it's probably a female, but it may not be very old, and they have to learn to hunt. What's the lifespan in captivity? 
Um, there's a guy in, in uh, Statesboro, Georgia right now who has a red tail that he trapped 24 years ago. He's still hunting. We had a balloon here and he's got a car, but it had died and they called DMR and he said if you go towards that bird, wear glasses because the bird still try to go for your eyes. Falcons don't do that because the uh, dollar just looking straight uh, they, in their they, eyes. They will. I mean, if you if you mess up, I, I saw I saw a picture yesterday on a Facebook group where the guy had the guy had his red tail on his shoulder right here. He had his regular glasses on, but he said he was talking about how bird the bird is not aggressive. This is the second year with the bird, and the bird's sitting on his shoulder. And I'm gonna tell you, that's dumb as a rock because if that bird reaches up. <coughs> Folks, they're so fast with their feet, I can't tell you how fast. He could lose his eye like that. And the, and the red tails, don't, don't think they can't hurt you. If, you know, maybe they haven't in a, you know, a few months, but they can and they will. It's bad. All of us have holes, scars. I've been grabbed in the face by a red tail. It's not fun. I, I made the mistake. My bird caught a squirrel. And sometimes a red tail, if they've done it a few times, they'll take a squirrel out of the tree and take it to a creek and drown it. They, they're pretty smart in that regard. Well, my bird did that. I went down to the creek, like Greg was talking about, tra I traded the bird off, took the lure out, threw it to the side. The bird let the squirrel go, went to the lure. Uh, she ate what was on the lure. I called her up to the fist for a tidbit, and she was fine. But now I had to get out of the creek or the area around it. It was real thick through there, okay? The, the two Jesses, oh, somebody's calling me. The, the, the two Jesses I thought I had control of, I didn't have control of the leg closest to my face. So I'm coming out of the creek like this from the bird right here. And all of a sudden, I guess she thought the beard was a squirrel tail. But she reached out and grabbed me. I had one talon under my ear, one under my jaw, and one in my mouth. And I'm going to tell you folks, it hurt like a son of a gun. My wife was with me and I balled up my fist. I was going to kill the bird. It was killing me. Fortunately, she let me go. But usually they don't. They have a ratcheting tendon. So when they grab hold of something, they ratchet that tendon down. They don't have to use muscle contraction to hold it. The tendon is locked. So there are times when they just can't let go, even when they want to. And that happens. It happens with, on you. It really hurts bad. You know, I've seen talons go through people's hand out the other side. Yeah. Yeah, there's certain there's certain breeds depending on what you hunt. If you want to hunt rabbits with Harris hawks, then beagles are great because the, the Harris hawks learn real fast what the beagles are there for, and they'll chase the the, the rabbits out into the open. Now you got four or five dive bombers. You know, um, if you want to hunt squirrels, a Jack Russell, um, there are other birds. I, I, my apprentice again is a guy who lives in, in uh, Atlanta. He's got five pit bulls. He takes a pit bull out, squirrel hawking. And the, and the dog does pretty good. And the bird doesn't mess with it. So it's pretty good about keeping the squirrels in the trees, not on the ground. So. Well, they go after armadillos. Yeah, they would, unfortunately. You don't want them to, but they would. It just depends on the bird. If the bird's really hungry, bird really hungry, you're talking about the, the uh, blue heron? I, I've seen a red tail hammer a blue heron. You ever heard a blue heron scream? You ought to hear it when a red tail grabs hold of it. Um, I've seen red tails take full grown gobblers. Um, they, you know, uh, Copperheads, rattlesnakes. You know, if the bird if the bird grabs a rattlesnake or a copperhead, I'm not helping it. You know I mean? It's gonna have to do what it does. You know. Usually, I go in to help. We go in to help. But if they got a hold of a copperhead or something like that, I, I, the bird's on its own. You know. Georgia has the greatest concentration of red tail hawks. What about? Georgia has the greatest concentration of red tail hawks. It's the most it's the most prevalent bird of prey, a raptor in probably in North America. Um, we have lots of red tails. Where what we do is 
there, there are certain areas in North Georgia that all falconers know they're going, they're going to be new birds every year. We don't know where the nests are, but there's got to be nests nearby because every year there's new birds. There's you know young young birds. The problem is every falconer in Georgia knows where those are too. <laughs> but but you have sometimes you have to put in lots of miles. Okay. Okay. Good.